imaginable instrument was pressed into service, even a fish slice. Some organic material, this remnant of a shoe, for instance, was too fragile even for the touch of human fingers. It had to be coaxed into a box with the gentlest of pressure on a cushion of water. It had no real substance left. At any moment, it could disintegrate and simply float away. And even the fish slice itself couldn't be left on the bottom. In no time at all, it would have disappeared beneath the shifting sand. Keep it level, Dave. It's pretty delicate. OK. I got it. Right. Most of it's there. Yeah. That's nice. In, in the sole, is it? Yep. In and out. Mm -hmm. The block itself was harder to free than some of the other items. It was actually welded to something else on the seabed by concretion that had formed round the decayed pin in its centre. It had to be hammered free. A thickish job this because there was no way of knowing what it was actually stuck to. But underwater, this one hundredweight of completely sodden wood was relatively mobile once it had been freed. The size of this ship's block gives some idea of the size of the Trinidad Balancera herself, the fourth largest ship in the Armada. But not all of her equipment was so massive. For much of it, only the gentle power of the water dredge would do. Finds like this musket stock, for instance, so fragile that it was hardly capable of being moved at all. Everywhere a tangle of light wooden debris to be nuzzled and sifted until something rare and recognizable came to light, like this mallet stock. The wood was hardly wood at all any longer. It still looked like wood, but after its long immersion, it was now 90% water. There was hardly any fabric left to hold it together. On the surface and exposed to the air, it wouldn't have lasted longer than half an hour unless preparations had been made to receive it and give it immediate first aid treatment. It was on occasions like these that the long months of preliminary training were seen to pay off. The closer they got to the central target of the excavation, the wooden wheel, the more obstacles revealed themselves. Every piece that was lifted seemed to leave another problem underneath. Now we're moving uh, pretty close into the wheel, Eamon. Um, a lot of this concretion around that we're going to have to deal with. Uh, some of it, I think, will come away as we start excavating underneath it. But some of it's attached pretty closely to the wheel. There's one particular object. It looks very like one of these helmets again. It's just there. We plotted it before, but only as it got clear did it get this helmet shape. Indeed, helmet shape was about all you could say about it. It was a ghost helmet only, preserved without substance in a sandwich of concretion. It's pretty fragile, but it's all there. Got a complete sort of double concretion showing the inside. And there's one of the brass studs. Yeah, Obviously a, a band of some sort. It lifts out the inner shell. Yeah, yeah. Uh,
It was another contact with the flesh and blood soldiers of the Spanish Armada, perhaps one of the 40 who drowned with the ship when she sank. But it's always that much more satisfying to find an object that is whole and real, to overcome the problem of freeing it without damage. To tackle such a fragile object as an olive jar, however insignificant, is a challenge. One slip and it would be gone. An olive jar, they call it. But to retrieve it like this, unbroken, means that you might be able to find out what it had originally been used for. It's got something in it, too, that doesn't smell very pleasant. No, no doubt. It, it should probably indicate what was in it. In fact, it had been lentils. Every diver begins to get involved with his finds. It's become a very personal thing to me. Yeah. I've been diving there all this summer, and every dive is the same. You still feel like exactly the same excitement. It has never died. There's, I'm excited all the time, every time I go out there and die, because we don't know what we're going to find. That's very exciting. In this case, it was a pewter jar. Less fragile, more durable, more personal. In this one small area, more and more personal finds are being made seeming to draw the divers closer and closer to the heart of the Armada tragedy. There are times like this when you feel like, you know, getting down there and having a go and pulling something out, you know, but you've got to hold it, sit back and wait till it's properly recorded and then properly handled before it's taken away. Naturally enough, you would like to be lifting things as you see them, you know, but um, you just have to restrain yourself, you know. When you discover, for instance, a pewter plate, down under it. You're working maybe for an hour and a half, two hours down there, and suddenly you find this plate. Naturally enough, the excitement of this old pewter plate, you say, like, I wonder who had it in his hand last. I wonder what a Spanish soldier or a nobleman or who was it. You know, and all this naturally ran, runs through your head. Oh, the mind's turning over all the time. You know? Oh, nice one, John. How about that, huh? Good condition for you, huh? Yeah, isn't it? Beautiful. Any names on it? Just trying to leave one piece. Doesn't look like it. Do you right. know the dinner set? But they didn't all eat off pewter, these Spaniards. One's feelings when one first of all starts to uncover an object, say the side of a wooden platter, are first of all of great excitement and anticipation that it's probably just a small part that'll come out quite easily. But this business of, of finding delicate material was something which we hadn't really anticipated, certainly not the organic delicate material that we did in fact encounter. And we certainly had no experience of this before, and underwater I think uh, very few people have. And so when we were confronted with this problem, simply when we exposed this material, we were committed to doing something about it. And so this is what they did, the eminently simple solution. Try not to change the environment of the object too drastically. One's got to think of ways of actually getting it out in one piece. And we found that using the sandbox is as good a way as any. The great thing is to avoid moving the object through the water too much, because movement is what pulls it apart, makes it disintegrate. So as quickly as possible, or rather as firmly as possible, bearing in mind its great fragility, we move the thing out of its embedded mat into the sandbox, and then fill the sandbox to the top with sand. It was an ingenious answer, a technique worked out pragmatically to suit conditions as they arose. The selfsame sand that had preserved the objects from complete destruction would give them that little extra lease of life before they began to disintegrate. It's then in a state to be lifted to the surface, transported to the laboratory, and subsequently re-excavated under controlled conditions. And in fact, that technique had been improvised only just in time to save one particularly special find, a complete Spanish musket stock. In his present condition, 
It had no more substance than a piece of soggy cardboard. Without the magic sandbox, it would never have got to the surface in one piece, and a unique survival of Armada weaponry would have been irretrievably lost. It was the variety of the finds that made the excavation such a challenging one. Here was a tremendous storehouse of Spanish domestic life lying jumbled on the seabed at their feet, with each object setting new problems that needed new solutions. When a, an object begins to uh, appear, uh, at first one has a feeling of great excitement because here's something new looking and new to one's experience. Uh, but, and, and one feels that it's going to be a small object, it's going to come out fairly easily. But as one starts to uncover it, and it becomes bigger, until eventually one finds that it's entire, a whole new problem is presented, a very difficult problem, and it's a very frightening problem, um, bearing in mind that this sort of problem hasn't been tackled by many people before, and so there isn't really experience to draw on. Who would expect, for instance, to find an ordinary pair of domestic fire bellows sitting in the middle of a shipwreck? Yet it's the only one of its kind now known. And it was only saved in almost perfect condition because the excavators had learned to improvise techniques for any eventuality. The sandbox was also useful for things which couldn't be moved in one piece. A provisions barrel might look fairly solid on the seabed, but as the material round about it was cleared, it began to disintegrate. The staves of the barrel were only loosely tied together with raffia bindings and came apart the moment they were touched. So the only thing to do was to dismantle the barrel completely and stow away in sandboxes the loose timbers, each one individually marked, and leave them there until there was time to take them ashore to be reassembled at leisure. Meanwhile, the excavation was moving steadily towards its main objective, the larger timbers in the centre of the day. This enormous balk turned out to be the yoke that had belonged to one of the huge wagons of a Spanish siege train, previously known only from a contemporary painting of a Spanish artillery regiment on the move. The massive timbers lying flat on the seabed turned out to be not part of the ship's timbers, as might have been supposed, but in fact portable and collapsible units from the same unexpected source, a Spanish siege train. All the apparatus of mobile land artillery. Seeking an Armada fighting ship, they had found an Armada invasion transport. That artillery and that armada had come to grief on the storm-swept coast of Ireland. And now, 400 years later, the elements did their best to wreck the Trinidad Valencera for a second time. Just as the best laid schemes of Philip of Spain were blown away in a gale, so too a carefully controlled underwater excavation can be mauled by a storm at sea. One can learn a little by noting where your own bits and pieces end up after a storm, but that's about the limit of its value to an archaeologist. It meant that even the largest timbers now had to be got out in a hurry, and it showed the devastating effect that an Atlantic gale can have on a ship long after she's founded. But the storm also helped to uncover new evidence of the Armada army, sharpened palisades ready to be thrown up as emergency barricades on land. The storm had hastened the clearance of the site, and that left the way open to tackle one of the massive wooden wheels. This had always been the major objective of the 1974 season, but it was not something to be rushed. It had to be worked out and planned beforehand. They wanted to find out whether the timber of the wheel was still strong enough to support its own weight, or whether it would fall apart when it was lifted. One of the preliminaries was to do a test lift on a 